start. Welcome to the Cleveland City Club, the citadel of free speech. My name is Sheldon Braverman, and I am president of the club. I am sure that many of you who have had the occasion to watch the numerous television shows where politics is the name of the game. Examples are The Capital Gang, Crossfire, Washington Week in Review, The McNeil Lair News Hour, Nightline, and Firing Line. While some of these programs are more serious than others, they all have one common denominator. Our speaker today, Juan Williams, a journalist and political analyst for the Washington Post, has appeared on all of these programs. Furthermore, Mr. Williams has written numerous articles in some of our most widely read journals. Examples are the New Republic, the Atlantic Monthly, Ebony, the London, London Sunday Times, and the Washington Post Magazine. Juan is also the author of the nonfiction bestseller, Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, 1954 to 1965. This is a companion volume to the critically praised PBS series. In Mr. Williams' 18-year career with the Washington Post, he has served as an editorial writer, columnist, and White House reporter. In addition to all these activities, our speaker is also writing another book, a biography of the late Supreme Court Justice and much admired Thurgood Marshall. When Mr. Williams focuses his attention on issues of the day, people listen. He is a serious voice in the not always serious world of political pundits. I am confident that the City Club audience will find his comments and analysis worthy of our attention, even if we don't always agree. Harry Truman once said, no government is perfect. One of the chief virtues of a democracy, however, is that its defects are always visible and under democratic processes can be pointed out and corrected. The comment on our government's imperfections and how they can be corrected, I am pleased to introduce one of America's leading political writers and thinkers, Juan Williams. Thank you all very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening, and thank you all for coming out. And what's just beautiful weather in Cleveland, just extraordinary this time of year. You know, uh, we get pretty cold sometimes in Washington. I remember last winter we had a stirring cold spell for about two weeks. I'll tell you how cold it was. It was so cold some of the politicians were walking around with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> but luckily, luckily I understand we don't have any cold weather coming until this weekend, so. You know, uh, Sheldon said to me that I should only speak for 25 minutes, and I thought, great. But you know, keeping it short and, and going quickly can have its disadvantages. I once heard about a politician who had gone to visit an old people's home, and you know how politicians are. The mayor sitting here smiling already, waiting for this one. The politician walks in, you know, to shake hands to get those votes. And just as he goes in the back, he sees a man laying in the bed there and shakes hand with the old man. And as he's doing so, grabs some peanuts from the side of the bed. And the old man says, please, please. And he says, look, I'm sorry. I should have asked first before I took your peanuts. And the old man says, well, it's not that. It's just that, well, I gummed the chocolate off those. I just put them back. <laughs> now, you know, that's why, that's why, although I, I'm going to go quickly, I won't go too quickly. <laughs> and luckily for you, journalists are trained to really keep it compact. We once had an intern at the Washington Post, and we asked him to do an obituary about this time of night, 7 o'clock, when the paper goes to bed for that first edition. The obituary came in, and the young man is there trying to prove how good he is. He goes off to his computer, and he taps out a few lines, and I'm waiting to edit it. And here it comes. The red light comes on my computer, and I thought, boy, this guy's good. This guy's quick. The story appears on my screen, and it looks something like this. It said, 
John Jones or somebody looked up the open shaft to see if the elevator was coming, it was age 45. <laughs> now, that's pretty good. So, not everyone's cut out to be a writer. I don't think the family was too pleased. But in that tradition, I will try to be quick and compact. And I wanted to start off by saying that these really are, in terms of American politics, quite extraordinary times that, that we are going through. Um, it is truly a moment when you can't predict anything. Things are just so up in the air. I mean, you just have to look around and understand how much change this country is going through. Uh, it, it really is shocking on some very elementary levels. I think to myself sometimes when I look and understand of all the third party movements going on in this country, Perot in 92, this time around we have Perot starting a third party and we have Colin Powell as a third force, that you understand that the American people really are reaching out, that the two party system is really struggling. I don't think the two party system can really claim to be in good shape at this point. If you look around, you see that this is a society, politically speaking, that's up for grabs. And that's in keeping, I think, with this season, this time of year, Halloween. Because <laughs> it seems to me that the reality of America in political 1995 and as we approach the presidential elections of 96 is we are going through a house of horrors. It seems to me that we don't know which way to look. We don't know which way is up, which way is down, and which way is out. I have a friend who uh, makes horror movies. I don't know why I admit it to associating with low-rent people, but it's true. <laughs> he makes horror movies, and, and he lives in Los Angeles, and he, he once called me up, he was having some trouble with a script, and he was just saying, you know, how would you handle this? And I just thought, well, this is fun, why not? Let's play along, and got stuck with him, and finally said, well, you know, what are the elements of a good horror movie? And he said, well, any good horror movie has three key things. Number one, Number one, you have a sense of unpredictability about them. You know, you're walking along the street and it's daytime and suddenly it's nighttime. Or you're walking and you think that you're looking up at the sky and suddenly the sky becomes a pit of hell or something and you're looking down. It's unpredictable. Number two thing he said, you've got to have authority figures go out of control. It's like your parents, instead of being nurturing, are destructive. Or you're walking along the street and you run to get some help and the people you run to get help from turn into boogie monsters, that kind of thing. It just is that the people who should be authority figures, the police, your parents, your teachers, become hostile. And he said the third thing to make a good, really good horror movie is you want people in isolation. And I thought right away, I know that one because I'm the kind of person who went to see Psycho and couldn't take a bath, you know, for days afterwards. <laughs> But I'm also the kind of person that if I look up at the screen and I see somebody leaving the campfire to go out in the woods or going down in the basement, I say, why are you doing that? Don't go, right? <laughs> but he said, that's the key thing for making a good horror movie. So I'm listening to him and I'm thinking, you know, wait a second. That's like the key things for political stories in the 1990s. I mean, these are the elements of good political stories are the same elements of horror movies because if you think about it, Politics in the 1990s is extremely unpredictable. I mean, who can forget that George Bush was at 90% popularity ratings in the polls, right? Cuomo and the others wouldn't run against him. He was so strong. He was invulnerable. No one thought that there was any chance that he wouldn't have a second term. Well, then here comes this unknown governor of a Midwestern state, a small Midwestern state at that, and suddenly he upsets this terrific colossus of a president and becomes the president and everyone is going, wow, what a great thing. Here comes this young, charismatic Democrat who's going to recreate Camelot in the spirit of the Kennedy administration. This is terrific. This is wonderful. And his wife is going to be a new model for the American woman. And wouldn't you know it, two years later, the Republicans have claimed not only the House but the Senate. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. It is literally a roller coaster ride through history at this moment. And if you talk for a moment about the idea of authority figures run wild, well, gee whiz, you just have to visit Washington to get the sense of what I'm talking about here. But you know the demagogues and the kind of acerbic, extremist, 
rhetoric is now kind of par for the course in Washington. The other day, they're having a debate, a debate about something so important as Medicaid, and you've got people punching and pointing at each other in the halls of Congress. You've got the Democrats out on the lawn holding hearings in the rain. You've got the Secretary of Labor sitting on like an a, a, a old wooden chair on the lawn because the Republicans won't let them have hearings in the hearing rooms. And you have to say to yourself, is this a serious political conversation or is this a gag? What's going on here? This is craziness. But of course, it's our reality in political 1995. And if you talk about something like isolation, well, you think about the political landscape today. This is really scary. Because it is the case that in political 1995, everybody gets divided up. Everybody gets divided up. You're either with the NRA or the AARP. You're either black, you're white, you're young, you're old. You know, it's unbelievable all the divisions and subdivisions and fragmentations that exist on the political scene today. And everybody is in some little subgroup demanding their share of the pie, insistent on it, in fact, angry about it, and willing to tell you that they're getting screwed by the other guy, and why is it that they can't have a little more? And you understand, I think, why we seem to be coming apart why I think the theme of the 96 election is really one of American identity. Who are we as an American people going forward towards that next century? You know, just this summer, it seemed to me we had so many commemorations. If you think back just for a second, it, it seemed like we were celebrating the, I think it was the 25th anniversary of Woodstock. You think back, it was 20 years after the pullout from Vietnam. It's now been 30 years since they started the Medicaid system. You think back a little farther and you go back to things like 50 years after the end of World War II and the death of President Roosevelt, 75 years since women's suffrage. Next year will be 100 years since the time of Plessy v. Ferguson and the idea of separate but equal being the law of this land. Really, so many commemorations and celebrations. And if you toss in a little bit, it's 41 years since the Brown decision of 54. We really are at a very important moment in history. It's as if, uh, in, you know, using Martin Luther King Jr.'s language, we've reached some mountaintop. And, and it's not quite the same idea because, of course, King was speaking of an ideal. But it's as if we're at a precipice where we can see back over so much history and take inspiration and information out of that history. And we need that inspiration and we need that information because we have such tremendous struggles presented to us today in terms of the changes in American society. You think about what we can see so dimly as we go forward right now, the tremendous amount of immigration affecting and impacting the United States. To have any concept of, uh, of, of an equal amount or equal rate of immigration in this society, you'd have to go back to the first decade of this century. And if you went back to the first decade of this century, you would see really a different kind of immigration because at that time most of the immigrants were coming from Europe and most of them, as the cliche goes, thought that the streets here were paved with gold. So they were coming here for opportunity and to educate their children. Today, today we have immigrants that come from Asia, from Latin America, from the South America, the Caribbean, people of color, and they come to this society not so much thinking that there is a great land of opportunity, but understanding that the United States is part of a global economy and that certain industries and certain opportunities are to be found in the United States. But they don't aspire to jump into some melting pot so much as they want to keep their ethnic, racial, national identities as they come to this country. And it challenges all of us. It challenges us to the point that you see in California a referendum that would say, we don't want immigrants. We don't, certainly don't want to serve or help those who might not be fully legal. And it's also the case that you see around the country more and more people saying English must be the language here, feeling threatened, threatened by the ascendancy of Spanish as a language in certain parts of our land. It seems strange, but we feel vulnerable, so we feel threatened. And then you have, in this time, in this nation, a terrific sense of people of people wanting themselves and their children to feel safe on the streets. They have a sense that maybe 
maybe they don't have the same security at work with all these large corporations downsizing or cutting or moving away. They have a tremendous sense of economic insecurity that adds into this sense that maybe, maybe America isn't serving me, maybe America isn't working for me at this moment. So what you see is that while we're under assault, if you will, from the outside in terms of tremendous rates of immigration, we also have internal migration going on. We have people moving from the Midwest and the Northeast, moving south into the Southwest. It's now to the point where 60% of America will live in the South or Southwest by the year 2010. That's not far away. And what a great shift that is. I see it in Washington in terms of the congressional delegations that used to be dominated by people from the Midwest and Northeast. Those used to be the powerhouse caucuses. Well, now that's no longer the case. The South is going all Republican. But it's not just that. It's that really the population center of the country is moving to that South and to the Southwest. That's incredible. An incredible, incredible change. So we have tremendous immigration, internal migration, economic anxiety, all of this going on, all of this going on at a time when we have an amazingly high rate of live births in the United States. If you were to create a chart, a graph, if you will, of this century, and look for the year in which we had the highest number of live births, you would find that the year where the spike hit the tip, the top, would be 1957. That's kind of the, the crest, if you will, of the baby boom. But the second highest year would be, guess what, 1991, kind of an echo of the baby boom. And the big difference between 57 and 91 would be that in 91, instead of just hitting a high point, it would hit that high point and then plateau out. We have continued to have that high rate of live births. Lots of family formation going on in the United States at this moment. Lots of people starting families, people who want some sense of security for those families, for those children, suddenly concerned more and more about politics, about the quality of the schools in their neighborhoods, concerned about the fact they don't feel safe on the streets at night, concerned about what kind of economic opportunity will exist for their children, will it match the economic opportunity that existed for them and for their parents. All of this going on at this moment. And at the very same time that there's all this insecurity, if you will, in the water, we see that people have become cynical and distrusting of government. After the Oklahoma City bombing, we at the Post had focus groups where we'd get people together to try to understand what was going on, and we did polling. And some of the polling came back with some incredible numbers that you may have heard of. One of the numbers was that 40% of the people polled said that they felt that the federal government was their enemy, that the federal government was out to get them. When I saw these numbers, I was stunned. I couldn't believe them. I thought, this must be the far right. This must be these people in militias. I can't believe that the average American citizens believe that Bill Clinton and Al Gore and Newt Gingrich and Senator Doe are out to get them. So I went and I looked at the numbers and broke them down. And what do you find? The people who are self-identified as left wing, as liberals, had an even higher percentage that believed that the ATF, the FBI, and the IRS was out to get them. So this is left wing and right wing. People simply believe the government is not their friend, is not acting in a curing, loving way in their lives, but is in fact acting to hurt them. It was really, for me, an incredible insight into the kind of anxiety and the kind of fear that exists in America in 1995. That the American people are looking around, discomforted and unhappy, scared and anxious, if you will, over their personal prospects, and looking with great anxiety for someone to come in and offer some leadership, some sense of identity, to lead them out of this house of horrors. And that's why I think you see the success of someone like Perot or someone like Colin Powell, someone who is identified as a trusting figure, someone who is seen as a person of character as opposed to someone of purely political experience. One of the things that I notice as I go around the country and as I talk to people and as I look in on focus groups, political focus groups, is that the one word that keeps being repeated by Americans today is community. They say they don't feel they have a sense of community any longer. And when they say that, of course, they all have different definitions. If you're talking to a 
to a young black person, sometimes it means that they don't feel that anyone really takes an interest in them and is looking out for their future. Or if you're talking to their parents, they say, you know, once upon a time, if this kid went out and acted up on the street, Miss Mary across the way would smack him on his butt and they'd take care of that boy. But now, that, that doesn't exist in the neighborhood anymore. Or if you're talking to a, to a white man, a middle class white man, he says, you know, I don't believe the company's going to keep me on for all time. I'm a middle manager. They're going to make cutbacks. I might have to move on. I don't know what I would do next. Or if you're talking to a young mother, she might say, you know, once upon a time, I think I was able to go down to the high school and talk to the principal, and the principal would take me seriously. But today, I don't believe that. The principal acts like I'm a pain. Uh, he doesn't have to listen to me. He's got too much on his mind. He's got to deal with the teachers union and the mayor and other things. But I don't count. I don't matter. I don't have a sense of community. And people get anxious about it. So when you put it all together, what you see is that Americans are reaching out, reaching out to someone or something that they believe can give them back their sense of identity as Americans, give them back their sense of community at home, someone who can say you don't have to be anxious about your economic fortunes and your future, someone who can say the racial divides in the country are not going to persist but are going to heal. But you know what? They don't believe it. They believe that the house of horrors is going to continue, that they won't find a way out. Well, I think tonight I want to leave you with this notion that, in fact, you do have the way out. The way out of this house of horrors is to be found in communities like Shaker Heights, is to be found in communities where people do take the time to go next door and know their neighbor, is to be found in communities where people are interested in the public schools, maybe even before their children are there or after their children are there. So they are watching and supportive, not simply critical. That we do know how to help each other if we simply take the time and don't get locked in to listening to extremist demagogues of the left or the right or simply listening to the radio and cursing the fortunes because the latest critic says this and that about some politician. It is the idea that truly we have the opportunity at this moment to impact history, to shape history, if only, if only we'll have more people like so many of you here tonight who have made your community a model for this nation in terms not only of race, but in terms of working together, caring for each other, prospering and going forward into a better future. This really is the way out of this house of horrors, but you would never know it. You'd never know it in too many parts of this country where people are dispirited. I wrote a book called Eyes on the Prize, and sometimes people say to me, why would you write a book and give it a title like Eyes on the Prize? What does that mean? Where does that come from? And I tell them it comes from an old gospel song that goes, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on. I know the one thing I did right was the day I started to fight, hold on. And what I'm saying to all of you tonight, here at the City Club, Shaker Heights, <laughs> is that you really have to understand that we are in the midst of a terrific and tremendous political fight in 1995, 1996. We are helping to shape the identity of America at a time when that identity is coming apart. We are helping to try to soothe tremendous anxieties in the American psyche that could easily become violent and filled with animus. But if they are properly shaped and properly directed, could also represent great energy, energy that could lead to innovation and inspiration and healing in the society. We are at a moment when we have to look within for that inspiration, when we have to feel our neighbor's hand in the night and understand that there is a way out of this house of horrors. Thank you very much. <laughs> Today at the City Club Forum in Shaker Heights, we are listening to Mr. Juan Williams of the Washington Post. We will return to Mr. Williams in a few minutes, but first, a few announcements. We welcome you to the City Club Forum, the longest continuously running free speech forum in the country. Our, uh, our welcome is for both members and guests in this room and those listening to radio station WCLV or one of the more than 170 stations throughout the country, including KVLU in Beaumont, Texas. We invite you to consider joining the City Club. Mr. Williams talked about a sense of community. If you believe in a sense of community, join the City Club. We are the community. There are membership applications in the front hall. 
If you would like to suggest programs or order a tape of today's forum, please call us at 216-621-0082. At our regular forum tomorrow, we will present Commissioner Mary Boyle reporting on the recovery of Cuyahoga County from the collapse of the Safe Investment Fund and the recommendations of the National Association of Counties to limit future losses in the investment of public monies. Next Thursday, October 26th, the City Club will present a special forum with Mr. Ross Perot. This program will start at 7 p.m. and will be at the Mentor High School Fine Arts Center on Center Road in Mentor. The cost will be $10 for City Club members, $15 for guests. Please make your reservations by calling the City Club at 621-0082. Now for our traditional City Club questions and answers. We would like Mr. Williams to return to the podium. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Please come to the microphones, one on my left and one on my right. Uh, first question, please. Hello, Mr. Williams. My name is David Weiss, and uh, welcome to Shaker Heights. Thank you. We greatly appreciate uh, your, your coming today. My question, uh, you, you obviously talked about community. And I guess my question, if you would just comment on the theory that part of the problem um, and the breakdown of the community is the change in the economic structure of the country and that people just simply don't have time um, to make and reach out to, to their neighbors because they're uh, too concerned about their economic uh, future. Well, the question had to do with the sense that people have of economic anxiety and the fact that that may impede their efforts to reach out to other people, reach out to neighbors, and create a sense of community in this country. I think that that, without a doubt, is right, that uh, if you look at most people and ask them about their busy lives, especially women in America today, they'll tell you that they are busier than ever and that women who had really once undergirded in some ways that sense of community because of all the functions that they would perform as volunteers and moms, just part of the PTA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and on and on, I think a lot of that has been drained away by the fact that people now are working two jobs in many cases, that people are occupied with busy lives that really, in some sense, leave them little leeway to get involved, to lend a hand, to get to know each other in terms of community. So it leads to this sense that people have that they don't know their neighbors, that they don't know the people at the school, they don't know much about their local church or synagogue, and, and leaves them feeling empty, that they don't feel connected, they don't have a sense of reaching out. They know a lot about cyberspace and the computer, and they have a sense about uh, you know, TV and sitting in front of the TV or turning on the radio as they're driving and listening to someone spout off, but they don't have a sense of being able to talk to the mayor or being able to talk to their congressman or senator or, or feeling that they make a difference. And the consequence of that is not that apathy reigns and that there's a low rate of voter turnout or even voter registration. It is that this cynicism begins to eat away at the body politic. It is that the system starts to break down, that people may not recognize it as such, but the system begins to break down. And as people lose faith in a democratic system, the democratic system loses vitality and its very own integrity. So it's a very dangerous moment unless we can turn that around. I came along at a time of the Great Depression where there was a great deal of economic stress as well as other kinds of stress. But one of the things that we had from our elders, our churches, our teachers, and members of the community is a sense of confidence that as individuals and with our families, we could deal with those stress. I joined a war on poverty and was instrumental in getting a lot of resources for people who became more and more dependent upon some other force, whether it's business or whether it's government. You know, the coal mines closed, and you had people that were waiting for 50 years waiting for the coal mines to reopen. Others moved on to the automobile industry and the steel industry. Now we have a world economy, and I would like to you respond to that as why, to the degree that we have come to look for others, just like with the recent march on Washington, we have lost that confidence in our own individualism and the confidence to deal with the problems. Well, I think that uh, the question is about a, a loss of sense of confidence and ability to deal with problems. And, and looking back, if you would, to the, 
to the Great Depression or even to World War II, I think one of the things that you'll notice is that at, at those critical junctures in American life, there was a can-do spirit that emerged. There was a sense of, you know, we're going to get out of this and we can pull together and America is great and all of those things uh, may be a little bit uh, blind by today's standards, but there was a great deal of patriotism that would paper over differences. There was a great deal of esprit about being an American and the importance of it. And you know, I think we've lost that in some very sad way. Uh, I don't think that there is necessarily that spirit. And it's an odd point to make because economically speaking, we are more vital and successful today than we were back then. I don't think there would be any argument about it. I notice this sometimes within the black community. You know, you run into kids who say to you, you know, things are worse today than they've ever been. You know, it's, it's just terrible today. And you think and you stop and you say, you know, my dad wouldn't be standing here speaking at the city club. My dad wouldn't be working for the Washington Post and couldn't get book contracts and couldn't appear on TV. They didn't have black people on TV. I mean, you talk about the Indians, you just go back and look at Larry Doby and just remember exactly, you know, what was happening not very long ago in American society. But isn't it odd in some ways, as President Clinton said a few weeks ago, we're in a funk, right? <laughs> we're in a funk. So I, I can only think that this has to do primarily with the family breakdown, that you don't have a sense that your mom and that there's a connectedness of uncles and cousins and grandparents out there. You don't have a sense of that safety net, that support. And you don't necessarily have the high regard for leadership. Leadership is more exposed in a way. People are better known in terms of who they are. We, we no longer could have President Roosevelt sit in that wheelchair and not have everybody talking about it and not have anyone take a picture of it. We certainly couldn't have that with the National Enquirer around. So we have really become, in some sense, disdainful of our own leadership at a time when our families and our institutions, everything from the church to the schools, are going through their own tumult. That is what I think makes for this great sense of insecurity and most dangerous of all, makes for the finger pointing at each other, the arguments over affirmative action, over immigration, the angry talk about feminist, and all of that, it seems to me, is the outgrowth of people who are scared and who are unhappy and don't have an optimistic view of their future. You mentioned this march on Washington this week. I got to tell you that I've had a lot of people get very angry with me because I said to them, I don't see how you could follow a bigot up there. I just don't see it. And people say to me, but you don't understand. It was really about the people that went, and it was really about a show of unity in terms of black men. And I say, I think that all that's true and all that's laudable. But I can't get behind someone who is not only anti-Semitic, but also very much a homophobe in terms of wanting to treat homosexuals in the worst way and treat women in an absolutely condescending manner and someone who talks about going on spaceships and all, I said, I don't understand it. I just don't get it. Um, so I, you know, I open myself up to that criticism, but I, I speak to you from the heart and, and truthfully. And I see people dance around this, but it speaks to me of the vacuum of leadership in the black community, especially for poor black people today. Mr. Williams, thank you for coming here to the Cleveland area. My name is Walter Brownridge. I live in Cleveland, but I have kids in the Shaker school system or the school district. Um, and I also want you to say hello to your rector, Paul Abernathy, an old friend of mine. Certainly. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a political science question from an article I saw in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. I don't know if you saw I forget the gentleman's name, but he wrote about the political transition is really becoming, um, we are going through one of those real realignments politically you're seeing the actual disintegration of the Democratic Party as a national force. No other reason to explain Bill Bradley and Sam Nunn and others quitting. This author's position was that by the year 2010, you will have two new political parties. They may have the name Democrat and Republican, but that Newt Gingrich, as the leader of one of the parties, is trying to remove the traditional Alexander Hamilton vision of republicanism, large national government to do problems, you know, carrying on from Hamilton to Abe Lincoln to Teddy Roosevelt, and a, and a sense of social tolerance in that context, versus the Jeffersonian view, which was anti-elite, anti-business, anti, in some parts of our history, anti-immigrant, and so on. 
and that Newt Gingrich, while he may even in fact want to try to keep Republicans of a wide spectrum in a big tent, that will be impossible to do eventually. You can't have a Bill Weld and a Jesse Helms, for is example. Is there a question, please? The comment is, have you, for example, heard the theory and that his position is that by the year 2010, you will have, for example, a party which is Jeffersonian and very anti-foreigner and anti-business and so on, and a Hamiltonian party of Bill Well to Colin Powell to Jack Kemp. It may leave out the radicals such as Jesse Jackson, but you know your comment about that theory. Sure. In fact, uh, today at the high school, a young man asked if he, if he, if I thought we might be seeing the end of the Democratic Party, and why was that happening? Well, I think in answer to your question about this changing political scene in terms of the party structure, I think what you have to look to is the idea that we have in America today more and more of a libertarian streak, if you will, in terms of the Republican side of the ticket, which is basically, as Colin Powell said, he is a social liberal but a fiscal conservative. And that this fits a surprising number of hats. I mean, some people would say that that kind of talk is really vacuous and doesn't mean much. What does that mean? But I would think that a lot, a lot of people would actually subscribe to that as a, as a title, if you will, for their political stripe. And people subscribe to it in part because, as I spoke of, they have a disdain for government in terms of government's ability to do anything in their lives that would be helpful, especially in terms of social policy. But they do believe that government has an important role to play in terms of keeping the economy going, that if the economy works, they're happy with government. If there's money in their pockets, they feel they can handle the rest of it. But what you do see at the same time is that the Sam Nunns, the Bill Bradleys, even Bill Clinton in some ways, dropped out of the Democratic Party. Now, Colin Powell says the Democratic Party is dysfunctional. That's why he could never be a Democrat. What a put down. It really is something that is incredible. But the reason for this, I think, is that it's not only that the notion of big government is so out of favor now, it's that these people feel that they could never join hands with those on the Republican side who are rather harsh in terms of promising the huge tax cuts, in terms of trying to cut away at the entitlements, in terms of saying that what this country is about is really making sure that people who have some are able to keep it and that we are going to be a nation that is going to be more tolerant of the homeless and the hungry and uh, if they're criminals, we'll just build more jails. We've already built an incredible number of jails, but we can build more. I think there are people who think that's not right. That can't work. That's leading us down the path to social destruction and chaos, but they don't have an answer. It's not the case that the nuns and the Bradleys are standing up and saying, here is the way, here is a different vision. It is the case that they are able to criticize what Newt Gingrich and the Republican contract stands for, but they don't have a strong vision. And I think you see that sometimes when, as the president did just yesterday, he comes out and says, gee, you know that tax cut? Mm, nah, that was too deep. Sorry about that, fellas. Well, he's looking to get reelected, but it's clear which way he's running. Now, you spoke about eliminating people on the ends there. I think it does, in some, to some extent, leave someone like Jesse Jackson out of the picture. But it doesn't, ironically, leave someone like Farrakhan out of the picture. In fact, I think it invites in extremists left and right, or if you can even use that kind of designation, but it invites extremists around the circle to the table because they can say that they have a strong complaint that does not fit in to this new political alignment and that they have a constituency that they speak for, and that their constituent is unhappy and furious and will complain and complain and complain and try the best they can to have a hand in trying to stop this new political alignment from taking place, and the media will pay attention. So you have larger and larger constituencies that will be unhappy as we reach towards this whatever is to come in terms of a new political alignment. Do you think that Colin Powell can get elected? Do you think that he will run? Do you think that he might heal this nation because he is more a centrist? And do you think that he would take his leadership um, more seriously in a sense than Clinton, who maybe allowed some of this vacuum to occur, particularly the first two years when he did not speak up 
for many of the positions that he had, that many of us felt that he had run for and that we stood behind him for. Well, the, the, the question is about Powell and whether or not Powell will run and whether or not he can, with his centrist positions, fill this vacuum that, uh, that you feel that Bill Clinton has in some sense created by shifting his positions during his time in office. I think uh, Powell will run. Powell has, uh, seems to me, given every indication of a man who's running. I, the, 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 the betting in Washington for the longest time was that, oh, it's just for the book. This guy's out there selling books. You know, he doesn't need it. Why take the headaches? Why take the scrutiny? Um, but even when USA Today ran a headline that said this summer Powell shelves bid for now, he was right on the phone to Bernie Shaw on CNN. He was right on the phone to all the political writers in Washington, let them know that headline was wrong. He hadn't made up his mind. And recently, uh, in response to Newt Gingrich's thoughts about maybe running because Powell wasn't sufficiently supportive of the Republican Revolution, he's made it very clear that he likes the Christian coalition, that he likes all the items on the contract, that he can go along with them quite happily. So he is positioning himself quite well to be a Republican candidate for the presidency of the United States. Now, will he be a healing force? I think it's a very interesting question because, you know what, white voters are very comfortable with Colin Powell. They think of him as patriotic, intelligent, hardworking, all of those things that you want in a political figure. But black voters, on the other hand, oftentimes have trouble with Powell, question where he was in terms of civil rights efforts, question his commitment in terms of saying things about everything ranging from affirmative action to social programs to his belief in large tax cuts at a time when the social programs are under threat. In some ways, uh, he's a paradox because normally, if I stood before you and we were talking about a major black candidate, you know, uh, Tom Bradley out in California, uh, Doug Wilder, um, we'd be talking about whether or not white voters are really going to go to the polling booth, close that curtain, and pull the lever for a black candidate. In, in the case of Colin Powell, we're talking about whether or not once he's an announced candidate, once his picture's all over, black voters will overlook their policy differences with him and the fact that his patrons were Reagan, Bush, Carlucci, and Cheney, and say, well, my God, here we have the chance for a black man to be president, and we'll support him. We'll cast in with him as a matter of faith. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, I don't know if it matters if it happened, because the polls indicate that he, right now, is wildly popular, the one candidate who can beat Clinton. In fact, the only way that he loses to Clinton, the only breakdown in which he loses to Clinton is among, guess who, black voters. They vote for Clinton more so than they vote for Powell. So it's kind of an ironic, difficult call to make, but I would say, you know, that through the dark glass that I'm always gazing as a political pundit, I think he's running, and I think he'd be very successful, and if it's a dull Powell ticket, I don't think it can be beaten. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Springstub, a high school teacher here in Shaker, and I, in some sense, I, I'd like to defend uh, some of my my black students uh, uh, over the years working in a in a wonderfully integrated high school. Um, I've I've learned a lot, and and in fact, several of my students went to the march on Washington, and to my surprise, uh, they came back with uniformly positive uh, experiences there, and I think, frankly, that. Louis Farrakhan had no idea what he had stimulated and that there was a very deeply moving emotional experience, extraordinarily peaceful, uh, loving experience that deserves the recognition of all Americans. And, 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 and that is uh, apart from the leader. Uh, I, I accept your, your, uh, your comments about the leader himself, but I truly believe it was beyond the man, and he had, he himself had no idea what would come of that. And I like your Is statement there a question, about please? okay, the, your statement about the way out. I think, in fact, it's too easy. Uh, we we love the idea of taking bread to our new neighbors and so forth, but I want to argue we're going to need real structural institutional changes in this country. The fact is, from what I've read, the average American family, the average white American family enjoys 10 times the wealth of the typical black American family. That is a fact. And if that is a fact, those economic disparities are going to have to be acknowledged by us in our institutions and so forth. And, and, and I just wish the answer were as simple as a return to community. But I truly believe in our schools, in our businesses, we've got to address these profound problems that we're still faced with. 
Uh, well, the question was, I guess, about the march and about the idea of structural change, especially acknowledging the terrific economic inequities that exist in the American social scene today, especially between blacks and whites. On the point of the march, I don't think there's any doubt that a number of people went there and had what I consider a transforming experience in terms of going fathers and sons, and you see so many black men together, I think really affirming the sense that there is so much to be done in terms of repairing the social network in terms of the black community. And I, I think there's nothing to be said but positive things about that. The negative, as I have said to you earlier this evening, is that when you do so in front or under the leadership of someone like Louis Farrakhan, you open yourself up for things that you have no idea uh, about, that you don't even know what's to come. You don't know what direction this leadership would take. You don't know what he's going to say in that two-hour rant that he would give, if he's talking about numbers or numerology or alphabets or whatever he's talking about. And you, you find suddenly that even with the best of intentions, people get carried away because of their own problems or their own immediate sense of need for unity and leadership. And history would tell us that this can lead down some very horrible and dark alleys. And I think that we have an obligation, you as a teacher and me as a journalist, to make sure that those young people understand that they don't exist, this isn't the first time this has happened, and that we have some way uh, to looking back and speaking honestly to them about the dangers of exactly this kind of interaction. Um, with regard to the issue of economic differences and inequalities, I don't think there's any doubt that those inequalities exist in America in such a way as to, as to make, make it difficult for people to, to do anything but to feel that, in fact, things are worsening, that if you look at the numbers in terms of class divisions in American society, not even black and white, but just generally, that there is more a sense of the rich getting rich, the middle class getting poorer, or trying to run in place to hold its place, and the poor getting much poorer. And this division extends into children. The children, we have an unbelievable, to the point I think that it's legitimate to use the word obscene amount of poverty among children, especially minority children, in the United States. And at a time when we talk about tax cuts, it heightens this inequality because the tax cuts and capital gains cuts and all that go to people who already have money. They don't benefit those who don't have in terms of the assets and wealth that come with mortgages and stocks and bonds and mom and dad having some wealth and inheritance that they could leave to you. So that really worsens the problem. And I think we're going down the path to more and more of that kind of class division in the society. I might add that that kind of class division will exist inside minorities, that you'll suddenly see the black middle class, which has been absolutely surging the last two decades, have real problems in terms of its connection with the black poor, which is what I think a lot of the kind of anxiety inside the black community is about, making sure that we don't forget who we are and that we retain our sense of identity. That's, that's an inside or intra-party discussion among black people right now, but it's one that I think is going to be more and more evident in a larger society. The question, though, comes down to this point, I think, in the political discourse, which is affirmative action. And I don't think that we as Americans can turn away from affirmative action at this point. And a large part of that argument would have to do with repairing this tremendous inequity that exists, not only in terms of economics, but educationally, in terms of social opportunity. It seems to me that there is a real obligation there. But it's too often the case, you know, you talk to young people. Young people say, yeah, you know, I didn't own slaves. Young white people, I didn't own slaves. You know, um, I want to get into this school, or I want a scholarship too. You know, my dad worked hard. My dad came from some country and busted his ass. Why do I have to give something away, you know? But the fact is that we all do have an obligation to history. The fact is that this country is riven by its history, and that to turn your eyes away from it is to be foolish and to invite great social instability. I think you heard earlier that uh, Ross Perot is going to be here at uh, another uh, Forum Foundation uh, meeting next week. I just wonder if you have any comments about him and what he's trying to do. Well, I won't make any jokes, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I find Perot uh, really an amazing figure on the political scene. Perot really is the X factor, if you will. He is the person who has transformed much of American politics now for the last two election cycles. 
uh, clearly Ross Perot has the ability to affect elections. To his ability to get 19 percent of the vote in 92 was really unbelievable. I, I still stand in awe of it. And what's even more amazing is that Ross Perot makes Colin Powell possible. I think he was the precursor to Perot. Powell, if you will, is son of Perot in so many ways. That if Perot was the guy who comes on the scene, you know, known for his for that book, you know, on the wings of eagles, and known as a man who starts EDS and makes millions, here comes Colin Powell with his own book as a man who's risen up through the military and led us through the Gulf War and he has proven himself in this way outside of the political, ordinary political sphere. And now Perot is forming this third party. It seems to me that he's almost inviting Colin Powell to jump on this vehicle and join with the people in United We Stand and go forward and create history, that this would be the vehicle. I think that's what Perot sees as well as I do. Now, Perot, I don't think, in terms of his own ability to run and be a candidate, can match his performance back in 92. I don't think so. I think people feel that a lot of his behavior at times was erratic, everything from telling President, you know, saying President Bush was trying to sabotage his daughter's wedding and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> dropping out of the race, coming back in. But Perot is tapping into all this anxiety. Anxiety that I might add is represented by a person like Pat Buchanan, who runs and says, you know, NAFTA's not good for us, GATT's not good for us, people have forgotten the blue collar worker in America. We do too much with these immigrants. Let's shut down the borders. Let's put America first. A lot of that kind of anxiety that feeds in to Buchanan is also something that could help to support a third party, which is why Buchanan says that he may run as an independent. So you may see several independents in this new 1996 uh, presidential landscape. Mr. Williams, I so enjoy your columns. Uh, columns. Uh, thank you very much for them. And I'm going to bring up another red herring. <laughs> um, I would like your uh, exploration of the O.J. Simpson trial and what it's done to our society. Uh, I believe it's uh, created more of a division between the races. Uh, in, when I'm in white circles, I hear remarks about uh, black people have a totally different attitude about justice. Uh, those black jurors let him go. They, they don't have the same. Uh, demands that we have about what is right. Uh, in black circles, I, uh, when I'm circulating in that, I hear comments about whites have no understanding what the police system has been like to us. And uh, in my own experience, when I first went to work in the field of integration, uh, as a wh white middle class person, I looked upon police as servants. And uh, I found that my black friends looked upon them as the enemy. So would you explore that? Well, I think you did a pretty good job of talking about the, <laughs> the different perspectives that exist on, uh, on police, just as police. I mean, clearly, I don't think anybody, black or white, is going to stand up and defend Mark Furman. I, I, I haven't run into that person yet, although they may exist, but I, haven't, I have not seen such a person. But when it comes to the attitude about the, the decision in the Simpson case, I think you see the same kind of frustration that existed after the Simi Valley uh, jury that found that those policemen were not guilty uh, for their horrible and tape, videotape beating of Rodney King. And you see much of the same kind of reaction. Now, I think in the Simi Valley case, it was overwhelmingly the case that most white people said, wait a second, you know, that's not right, that's wrong. And the federal government stepped in with federal civil rights violations charges that led to these people being convicted in jail. You don't have a similar consequence or similar repercussions in terms of the Simpson verdict, but you do have a sense overwhelmingly, if you just poll the American people forgetting their racial designation, that Simpson is guilty. What is striking to me is, one, I almost say this with a sense of guilt, that the media in this country would have you believe that every black person thinks that Simpson is innocent and that every white person thinks Simpson is guilty. The numbers indicate that if you look at the numbers, I think it's about five and a half or six per, 60 percent, let's say, of black people think that Simpson should have been found innocent, and about 70-something percent of whites think that Simpson should have been found guilty. But that's not, clearly that's a preponderance, but it's not all. And I think it's important to understand that. The second thing that I think it's important to take into consideration here is that if you ask someone about the jury's actions, you are not necessarily asking them whether or not they think Simpson killed those two people. You're asking them whether or not 
the prosecution put on enough evidence, whether that evidence was believable, whether or not the prosecution proved its case. And that's a different standard. But these two things are confused when you ask these questions generally. And I think that they speak to some of what you put in your question, which is, how do you feel about the police? Do you think they're trustworthy? Do you believe that the police did a good job in collecting this evidence? Do you believe that the police would not plant evidence, would not set someone up? Do you believe that the police are to be trusted? Are they trusted in your community? Well, clearly, I don't think anybody would doubt this. There's just different experiences in terms of being black and white in America when it comes to what the police represent and whether or not they are protecting your community or terrorizing your community. I just think there are different experiences. I'm on the board of my college, Haverford College in Pennsylvania, and we had a board meeting a few weekends ago, and one of my fellow board members said he remembered going downtown to Philadelphia, and he would see those police officers with the high boots and the German shepherd dogs, you know, that would pull at the chains whenever they saw him. And he said it absolutely struck terror in his heart, but he always thought that when the little white girls from Bryn Mawr went by those same cops and smiled, that they felt protected. And I thought, you know, that's a very clear example of the difference in a, in a very similar common experience. And, and I think that it is all too true in terms of America. But I, I, don't, uh, I don't say any of this with, uh, with joy in my heart. I think it really is sad to see the kinds of divisions that exist. And I must say that the whole Simpson thing, really, I sometimes feel depressed about it because it seems so awful. You know, I have, I, I, just, I guess I feel bad whenever I think about justice not being served. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, I don't, I don't know how you define justice in this case. I mean, in some ways, I think that the behavior of the police is something you cannot, cannot abide. But the murder of two people also is something you cannot abide. And so it, it, it just feels to me almost like a defeat for all involved. Good evening, sir. Yes. Um, I was born and raised in Shaker Heights, Ohio. I now live in Miami. I have two questions for you. One, I wonder why white America doesn't leave O.J. Simpson alone. He was found not guilty. That's the end of it, period. All right, the second question is, as far as the immigrants um, coming into the country, I have a beef with that because they come into the country and they work for less than minimum wages and they take jobs from your mother, my mother, and everybody else's mother and father here because they work for less than minimum wages. And what do you do about that problem? I mean, that's a serious problem. Well, I think that lots of people would agree with you, especially emotionally in terms of the response that you see to immigrants coming from so many communities around the country. You know what's uh, difficult, though, is that, in fact, when the social scientists do studies on the impact that immigrants have on the economy, especially on local economies, and especially on black workers at the bottom of that economic scale, what they find is that rates of income actually are increased and what they find is that there are more and more people spending money, there are more and more people creating businesses, and that unemployment goes down. Now, I know that might seem counterintuitive to you, but I just point that out to you as what the numbers show. But I know that it feels wrongheaded. And I know that so many people feel that there are people who come into this country, and they come in and they don't have the same sense of the history and the hurdles that have been put in place for people of color in specific, and yet they come into this country with an attitude that they can do it, they can get it, they go forward. I mean, I think it came out in large writ in that California business about affirmative action where you see that the Japanese and the Asians, for the most part, were opposed to this kind of affirmative action promise, did not stand with the blacks and the Hispanics in California when the uh, Board of Regents was voting. Struck me as very interesting. But it is that the immigrants have a different experience of America, and I might add, that in this most recent wave of immigration, you'd be surprised at how many of the immigrants are actually college educated. It's over 20 percent. And you'd be surprised at how many have PhDs, something like 5 to 7 percent. So these people are coming and competing at the highest levels in some ways of the society. And it's very different, and I think it's very threatening to many people. As to your um, first question, uh, I'm out. Thank you very much. <laughs> If you wish to order a tape of today's program, please call the City Club at 216-621-0082. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Shaker Heights. The City Club Forum is adjourned.